today we've got a little bit more dot product to talk about. We talked about how we can find the dot product, and we've talked about one thing that it gives us, the angle between a couple of vectors. So let's take a moment and find the angle between these two vectors using the dot product. So we're going to need two th uh, three things. We're going to need the magnitude of each of these vectors, and we're going to need the dot product of the vectors. So the magnitude of B is the square root of 6, and the magnitude of A is going to be the square root of negative 2 squared, 3 squared, and 1. So 4, 9, and 1, 14, square root of 14. We also want to get at the dot product of the vectors, which we'll find by finding the sum of the products corresponding components. So B dot A is one times negative two, one times three, and two times one. So it looks like three. Now we have enough information to ask our calculating machine, what's the angle between vector E and A, or A and B? On a related note, notice that we found B dot A and, and A dot instead of A dot B. And we can note, we can see that it's going to be commutative because it's just based on regular old addition and multiplication. We're just finding the products of the components. The components are real numbers and multiplication of real numbers is commutative. So the dot product is also commutative. Find theta. Our dot product is a dot says b dot a is a magnitude of b times the magnitude of a times the cosine of the angle between them. So to find theta, We'll do the cosine inverse of b dot a divided by the magnitude of b times the magnitude of a. I want to make sure I divide the 3 by the square root of 6 and then also the 3 by the square root of 14. So I'm going to put that denominator in parentheses. First of all, I know it's a math class, but we want to be in degree mode anyway. So 3 divided by the denominator, square root of 6. I have to close that square root times the square root of 14. And I got to close that square root. I got to close the denominator. Then I'll close the cosine inverse command. Looks like 70.9 degrees. Any questions? Let's draw a picture of the vectors B and A and see what this value is going to tell us, or see what the dot product is going to tell us. So, I need to be looking, I'm, instead of drawing, setting up a set of axes with X, Y, and Z, I've only got two vectors that are sitting in a plane and the angle between the two vectors is 70 degrees. I wanna reorient my view so that I'm looking straight down at that plane. So I don't have to draw these, these vectors in weird directions on my paper because I'm trying to draw them on a prescribed set of axes. I'm gonna say, 
the two vectors are sitting in the plane of my paper and the third axis is sticking out perpendicular. That way I don't have to draw them at, I don't have to set up my axes first. So I'm gonna look down at the plane and I'm gonna have vector A down here. And then I'm gonna draw vector B at an angle of 70 degrees. And it's gonna be shorter than angle A because the magnitude of A is square root of 14, the magnitude of B is square root of six. So B is gonna be shorter than A. And we've got a 70 degree angle that we just found between them. I also oriented this plane so that A is horizontal because it's easier to draw, even though I didn't quite draw it horizontal because I can't quite see the dots. Now we're gonna think back to the problem that we did yesterday. We said had a similar setup with our force breaking into horizontal and vertical components. And I'm gonna find the component of B parallel to A. I'm not gonna say horizontal. Horizontal means it's gonna be in the XY plane or in two dimensions along the X axis. I'm gonna find the component of B parallel to A. So we're gonna find the component of B parallel to A. In this case, parallel to A just means in the direction of A, in the same direction as A. That's gonna be the component of B parallel to A. We're gonna say that this is the projection of B onto A. But we're gonna write the projection onto A of B. So projection, A subscript, B. And then we're just gonna do what we did yesterday. Take the hypotenuse and multiply the cosine of the angle between them. The hypotenuse is just the length of B. So B has a length of square root of six. So I'm just gonna take the hypotenuse square root of six and multiply by the cosine of the angle. So it's gonna be square root of six times the cosine of theta. Oops, I know what theta is. Does everybody see the parallel between this and the problem that we did yesterday where we broke a force into its 
horizontal and vertical components. Instead of horizontal, I just have this rando direction A, and we're projecting B onto A and seeing how much of B is going in the direction of A. Oops, I didn't want to write that there. This is what we're trying to get at. We want to know how much of B is going in the direction of A. This is the same question that we had yesterday. How much of that 300 Newton force was moving horizontally? How much of this vector B is moving in the direction of A? So just rather than just having horizontal and vertical components, I've got a component of B parallel to A. But then we look at this and say, dude, that's not a vector. That's just a magnitude. Because this is a square root of six is a magnitude. Cosine of 70.9 is a magnitude. What's the direction? So we need to describe the direction. So this is just all magnitude. just magnitude. That's kind of what I'm trying to emphasize here. It's just magnitude. Where's the direction? We need a way to describe the direction of A. We need a way to describe the direction of A. So I'm gonna take A, I'm gonna say it's going in that direction. So I describe this direction of A with just the vector A but I can't just multiply this by A because A has a length of the square root of 14. I want a unit vector in the direction of A. Right now, the length of A is square root of 14. How do I take the length of A and break it down to one? I will just scale the vector down by a factor of one over the square root of 14. I'll multiply by one over the square root of 14. So I just divide by the magnitude of A. That A over magnitude of A is a unit vector in the direction of A. I could have written square root of 14. This is the new thing that we're adding to what we did yesterday. Yesterday, I wanted the horizontal component of a 300 Newton force. I didn't have to include any information about the direction that that, that horizontal component was going because we were calling it horizontal component. It was the X direction. So horizontal component, I said it's the flat part. But now we're going off in some rando direction, A. I need a unit vector in that direction. I can't just use one zero. That's a unit vector in the horizontal direction. I need to describe the direction of A, but I need to make it a unit vector. Otherwise, the length of A will be affecting how much B is projected onto A. So I make a unit vector in the direction of A by dividing by the magnitude of A. questions. Here's why we might care. 
let's suppose that we've got A and B pulling on something and we're trying to calculate work along the A direction. We want to know how much is B helping pull in the A direction. We got a train on the tracks. Someone is standing on the tracks and pulling the train. The other person's like, oh, dude, I am not standing in front of a train and pulling it towards me. That thing is heavy. If I trip, I'll be get run over. So I'm gonna go stand off to the side. I'm gonna pull at this 70 degree angle. And you're like, oh, dude, that's a little bit far away. Why don't you just stand right off the side? He's like, oh, nope, 70.9 degrees. That's where I feel safe. We wanna know how much that B vector is helping pull the train along the A direction. Any questions? How's everybody okay? We want to look forward from this problem. We want to think about the dot product. Because if you're thinking, wait a second, you just said work is equal to force times distance. Does, it, does that mean that this dot product business is going to show up in an integral? And some of you are thinking like, oh, dude, I was not thinking that at all. I was just trying to think about this dot product business. And now I'm a little bit panicked because I wasn't thinking about integrals at all. Why did you bring that up? What the hell are you doing, man? Clearly trying to unsettle you. But if we think about integration, so set your way back machine to last semester where you were doing integration. The applications of integration are just applications of multiplication. Integration is multiplication, but one of the factors is variable. That's how we think about integration at its baseline, at its core. It's just addition because one of our factors is variable. If one of our factors is variable, we don't get to multiply. We've got to do this integral. Uh, we've got to do this addition business. And if one of our factors is continuously variable, then we've got to do integration. That's kind of like your hierarchy. Easiest. All your factors are constant. Congratulations, you get to multiply. Variable, but discreetly variable. You can just do a bunch of multiplication and then add them together. You got to drop it back a level. You got to go from your multiplication. You got to drop it back to addition. Then up one more level, continuously variable. Now you've got to integrate. Just thinking of the future, so thinking in terms of the future, these dot products will show up in integrals. And we're gonna to wanna to know what are some applications of these integrals of dot products? And the applications are gonna be exactly the same as any application that we have of the dot product. When we're trying to think of things that we can do with line integrals, that's an integral of a dot product. When we're trying to think of what we can do with these integrals of dot products, all we have to do is think about what can we do with the dot product? Once we have that, we will have applications of integrals of the dot product. Same thing happened in Calc 2. What can we do with multiplication? Anything that we can do with multiplication is available as a target of integration. You can turn it into an integration problem by making one of the quantities continuously variable. That's why most of the problems that I did were area, because it's just length times width. Everything else is just window dressing on that. Distance is equal to rate times time. Work is equal to force times distance. Force is equal to uh, pressure times depth. Oh, I have to switch to AM gold style and many more. But no one knows what AM gold is. I'm looking around. So you used to, when you used to buy music, you actually had to buy a physical thing that the music came on to put it into a player. It just doesn't, just didn't beam down from space onto your phone. And so some companies were like, well, hey, what if we take a 
make a mixtape and sell it to people. This is also like before you could make your own mixtapes, right? Does anybody even know what a mixtape is? Do you ever wonder why you call it a mixtape? You're like, oh no, I call it a mixed CD. Does anybody know what a CD is? That, that's one of the ways you can portable your music. CD. Some of you might be into it. You might have like vinyl, right? Vinyl records, which are like proto CDs. I've wandered off the point. You've been, if you've been in my class before, it's like, oh, yeah, like usual. This only happens like once or twice a day. But anyway, that's all beside the point. Oh, right. So there used to be companies. See, I couldn't let it go. I just couldn't let it go. It was sitting there bugging. You forgot something. You just walked into a room and forgot why you're there. So you just stand there in the room for like five minutes. Knowing that I won't remember why I walked into the room until I walk out the room. So I don't know if this is a more coffee problem or a less coffee problem, but I know what to do. So the company would say, let's get, let's make mixtapes and sell them. And then they advertise on TV. AM gold. And the music was geared towards people probably in their 50s and 60s. So like in the 80s, you get people looking at an ad for a mixtape of songs from like the 40s and the 50s. If you want to figure out what music your kids are going to like, just watch what they're, watch, watch what they're listening to when they're 14. That's like, think about what you were listening to when you're 14. Think about how that music makes you feel. When you're 50 and you're a program director at a, at Sirius XM or whatever the next evolution is, that's what you're gonna be pushing. Those are also the movies you're gonna make. Think about the shows that you watched when you were 14. You're gonna to wanna to make a movie out of that. And so they would advertise on TV and they would list all the tracks that they put on their mixtape, their four, four cassette tape set. That you could buy for four easy installments of eight ninety nine or whatever, and then at the end they couldn't list, they wouldn't list all of them. They list like fifty songs, and then at the end it'd say plus three more. I'm like, oh, dude, you listed fifty songs. Just list what the three more songs are. I guess their thinking was like, oh, you're gonna have to buy the collection to find out. And I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm not. And I just changed the channel. Oh, sorry, I changed the channel. Then your parents would be like, oh, you should go outside. And so you walk over to the TV. Turn it towards the sliding glass door. Open the sliding glass door, stand out on the porch. And then anyway, what are we talking about? Oh, yes. So one of the examples that we use for this is work is equal to force times distance. This is good because this is one um, that we encountered when everything was just going in one direction. But what if your force was going in all kinds of directions? And what if your distance was going in all kinds of directions? What if we have a path through R3. And at every point on this path, there's some force acting on this path. So let's suppose that this path is just cruising around through R3 and there's swirling winds. So that at each point on the path, we have a different amount of force acting on the path.
how much is that force helping or hindering as we move along this path? How much work is that wind doing moving us along this path? At each of these points, I've got this force. It's kind of like pushing us off to the side, but some of that force is pushing us in the direction that we're trying to go. It's like a crosswind. What direction are we trying to go? Well, we'll need a tangent at that point. At this next point, F2, there's the force pushing on us, kind of almost to the, uh, still pushing us along. What direction are we trying to go at that point? Tangent. At F3, it doesn't look like it's helping much at all. It's almost kind of coming directly across us. Because what direction is the force going? Straight up. And what direction are we going? Tangent to the curve. Same thing at F4. At all these different points, I've got all these different dot products. How much is that force helping us or hindering us. We'll use the dot product. We'll find the projection of that force onto the direction of our path. The dot product is a local thing happening at each of these points. Right now I have four. I'll add up those values and that'll be the work done, an approximation of the work done. How do I make a better approximation? We just do the calculus thing. Do this more often. If I had eight points, that would be better. If I had 20 points, that would be better. We're playing the calculus game. How many points are we going to use? Infinitely many. And when we're trying to find a sum with infinitely many terms, we're making an integral. Same stuff different environment. It's the same integral thinking that we had before, just we need to figure out this new operation, this dot product operation. And we also need this direction operation. I need tangents of curves in R3. Heck, I need to describe stuff too. I need to be able to describe that path in R3 so I can make this calculation. Any questions? This is a very early introduction to stuff that's going on later, but we want to see how we think about things and why we think about these things. We want to know how much, uh, but we just, and we're introducing the, uh, the idea of the dot product early. Because I want you thinking about this dot product in this context. How much of one vector, it's going to be able to tell us how much of one vector is going in the other vector's direction. And I just need this, this part of the projection and then A over absolute value, uh, A over magnitude of A. How's everybody okay? It's like, oh, you brought up integrals were not okay. Furthermore, you called them line integrals. What the hell, man? It's even more messed up. We call them line integrals, but then we apply them to these curves. Messed up, man. Messed up. We can call them curve integrals, but I think someone thought that sounded weird. Plus, it's still just a one dimensional curve. So it might as well be a line. It's got forwards and backwards. I don't know. I don't know what the thinking was. I wasn't at that meeting. I skipped most of these meetings. Like the one about pi. Let's make this super important number, the ratio of the circumference of a circle 
I'm like, well, I like where this is headed to the diameter. So close, so close. Could have used the radius. Instead of pi being 3.14, would have been 6.28. If I could go back in time and change it, then I would. And it would just be 6.28. Because pi really bugs me. Partially because it's the circumference of a circle to its diameter. But the defining thing about the circle is the radius. The circle is everything one distance from a single point. So we could have had the ratio of the circumference of the circle to its radius. Then instead of a full circle, 360 degrees being two pi radians, it could have been pi radians. So half, a quarter, and the fractions would have been a lot easier. And like, oh, nope, we're gonna use the diameter. I mean, that's not even how you would draw a circle. If I give you the diameter of a circle and I ask you to construct it, you need to take that diameter, cut it down to a radius, then you draw a circle. You know what I mean? It would be insane to change it now without a time machine. You can't just like change what you're doing. It's like, well, we're not gonna use pi anymore. We're gonna use tau. And people be like, oh, what, what, what about pi day? If we switch to tau day, it would happen on June 28th, at least in America where we write the month first. But June 28th happens during the summer vacation. So students wouldn't experience it. So it's gotta be in March. There go pi day. What are you talking about? Other complaint about pi day is that people start using the rest of the number to be like, it's like three for the month, 14 for the day. Why 14 for the day? Why the first? Why is it the 14th? Why is it, why is it 3.1? Because the number goes on forever. So why are you not using one and then four is like four o'clock? But they're like, oh no, no 14. And then 3.1415. And so like at uh, 159, so at 159, that's not in the afternoon. 159 is right before two o'clock in the morning. So I guess we're gonna be celebrating Pi Day down to the minutes at bars right before closing. What are we talking about? Oh yeah. What I want you to think about the dot products. How to calculate the dot product, that's certainly, I don't know if important is the right word, something that you'll want to be able to do both ways. You want to be able to use the dot product to find the angle between vectors. That's a, a skill that you'll need to have. But I want you thinking about dot product of, by, as it, it's part of the question, how much of one vector is going in the direction of the other vector? What is the component of B parallel to A? How much is B helping motion in the A direction? And if the angle is greater than 90 degrees, how much is B pulling against A? Because then if A, if a theta is more than 90, then the cosine of theta is negative. So the component of B in the A direction will be negative. That means it's pulling against. So this person's like pulling along the train tracks and this person is standing behind the train trying to stop it. No, stop, you'll get run over. Meanwhile, vector A is like, well, I'm trying to train for strongest vector competition. Any questions? Tomorrow we'll talk about the cross product and what it tells us about vectors. That's it for today. I'll see y'all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.